So welcome everyone to lecture number three. Um, we had a couple of people in the Zoom meeting at the beginning of this week. Um, strangely enough, I did not get any email about the assignments, which either means that you guys are all very, very good and don't need any help, or it means that some of you didn't try and do the assignments. And I'm hoping it's the first, but from experience, I know it might be the second. All right, but were you able to do the assignments, uh, General Gulag? I don't mind people not joining the, the Tuesday thing. That's not the big issue. The, the, the issue is, is that I... 90%, all right. Next slide in German. Oh my God, Testosaurus, you saved up way, 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 way too much channel points already. All right, um, it's good to do the next slide in German. That's actually very easy because the next slide is just the intro slide, which doesn't have anything on there. <laughs> um, guilty. Um, guilty of not doing the assignments. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Um, anyway, let's just start, right? So... Um, I will have to move my windows around a little bit. I was picking up packages like five minutes before we had to start. I did all the assignments. Very good, very good, very good. So let's see if the answers match my answers. Uh, I think I already put the answers on Moodle. I also put the assignments on Moodle. Um, but uh, I will first do uh, Testosaurus' his, uh, next slide in German. So uh, let's see what the next slide is. So. <gasps> Hallo und willkommen zum Datenanalysen mit das Statistikpaket R. Um, ich bin Danny Arends und that's all. That's your whole slide in German. <laughs> oh, ich arbeite an dem Fachgebiet uh, Suchtungsbiologie und molekulare Tiersuchtung. Uh, so yeah, well, uh, like there's not much more on the slide. You could have known this. Like the slides follow a very standard layout. <laughs> The assignments were tough. Um, yeah, they were. They were. They were. Uh, okay, see you on Tuesday. My work is done here. <laughs> yes, see you on Tuesday. Um, yeah, the assignments were tough. Um, and that is because they are a little bit different from normal, uh, normal, normal assignments. Um, and that is because I want you guys to kind of get familiar with if statements and for loops. And the thing is, most R courses or most programming books about R don't explain for loops and, and these kinds of things. Um, I don't know why they don't, because like they generally only teach you to use the apply or the lapply function, but um, it's something that if you learn it and you do it properly, it's, it's a really big help um, because it allows you much, much more flexibility. So I hope that everyone um, tried to do the assignments at least and got stuck at a certain point. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I know that they are difficult. Today they will be a little bit easier, although there's one which is really, really hard. So I'm already going to prepare you guys that... Um, let me look at the assignments for today. Um, um, because you will be in for a, a very, very difficult assignment. Um, so assignment number four and number five today will be really hard again. Um, but like you have to remember, I don't want you guys to know exactly, like there's there's part of the lecture just shows you what's possible, right? Um, and like today we were talking about reading in binary data and I only learned that like four years after I started programming R. I need to practice more. I'm sure walking was once tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is, is that I also want to show you guys what's possible, right? So like today's assignment, there's assignment number four and assignment number five. And you will see like one of them is about continuing uh, an analysis that you already started. And the other one is about reading in binary data. And these are things that I only learned when I was using R for like three to four years. So they are relatively advanced concepts, um, but I want to kind of show you how I do it. Um, and if in the future you have to read in binary data, then you can just 
take the slide um, and just copy the code and adjust it to how you need it, right? It's also giving you guys some tools. Um, but let's just start with the lecture, otherwise we're sitting here like chatting for 10-15 minutes. Um, by the way, uh, we have 26 viewers at the moment, so if everyone can say hi in chat, then I have 20 people talking at once, which is one of the Twitch achievements that I still need to get. And if I get that achievement, I get, I think, like 15 more um, things. So you see that some people have like a diamond in front of their name and uh, Anna has like a little sword. Um, but um, so if everyone just says hi, then we have 20 people chatting at once and that should be enough to get me a couple more diamonds that I can give away so that people can be like VIP to the channel. Yellow, yeah, you can say anything that you want. All right, thank you guys. Welcome everyone. Good, so for today, um, first things first, let's look at my answers for lecture two. We did a couple of them already um, during the Tuesday seminar um, and I can do them live if, if you want, um, but I, I think um, I will just show you guys my answers. All right, so here we see my answers. Of course, um, every file that I make starts with a header. Um, just to let people know that it's my code, I did it, I changed this one in 2017. Um, so if I change the assignments somewhere after 2017, they might not directly match, but at least I know, right? Um, so it's good to kind of write down what this file does, who wrote it, when was it first written, and when was it last modified. So just try and keep that in mind that every time that you start an R file, you just type that in. All right, so the first question was to draw a random number. Um, so question 1a, just use the uniform function. Of course, you can use something else as well. You could draw a normal norm, from a normal distribution as well. Um, but the question here was to draw from a uniform distribution, I think, and store it in unknown. So one of the questions that we had on the Tuesday seminar is this, this arrow thingy here. Um, you don't have to use the arrow. You can also use the is. Um, there is no difference between the arrow and the is. Um, the only advantage is, is that the arrow can point backwards, um, but the arrow can also point forward. So a statement um, like this um, is the same thing. And of course that you cannot do with the is because this works, but this doesn't work because now I'm trying to assign the unknown variable into the function. So that's not allowed. So with the arrow, I can just very basically say, well, um, assign from the left side to the right side or assign from the right side to the left side. All right, question 1b, test if this number that you just drew was higher or lower than 0 0.5. Um, so I'm just writing a basic if statement. So if unknown is smaller than 0 0.5, um, I use the cut function here. I like the cut function much more. Um, yeah, you can use the print function as well. Yeah, the print function does kind of, it's, it's very similar to the cut function. Um, the cut function is a little bit more flexible um, because you can say file equals um, out.txt and then it will write to a file. Um, and that is more useful because generally you don't want to have stuff printed on the R window, but you want to print stuff to a file, right? Normally, if you would have like an analysis, um, then this analysis would write a log file. So after each step in the analysis, you just write to the log file. Um, and that makes the cut function a little bit more flexible. Um, if you use the print, um, like Rishvan did, then you don't have to specify the enter key. Um, so the enter. Um, if you have to use the cut, or if you use the cut function, then you have to specify the slash n um, for the enter key. All right, so just let's run this a couple of times, right? And see if we can draw a number which is higher than 0 0.5. Um, so let's show you guys the R window, and there we go. So first number we draw was higher, um, and of course we want to see what we drew. So we drew 0 0.64, and we can do again, another higher, another higher. Well, that's, that's quite uncommon, right? There's three times in a row, like rolling a dice, or rolling like a coin and getting heads. So let's see if we can be lucky and get, no, so lower. All right, so that was the first question. So relatively easy question. I, I hope everyone was able to do it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so next one. Um, here is um, 
here I wanted you guys to use the other parameters for the function. So the other parameters are drawing one random number, um, then you give the lower bound and then you give the upper bound. Um, of course there's also an, another way to do this because you can also just draw a random number between 0 and 1 then multiply this number by 40 because that's the range right from minus 10 to 30 and then just subtract 10. Um, many different programming languages so R allows you to do this but a lot of programming languages only allow you to do this so all random numbers um, is uh, Yeah, yeah, no, no, using print is perfectly fine as well. I don't think that I specified what you should use. If I want you to use a very specific function or something like that, then I will write it in the, uh, in the, in, in the question. Um, so, and in this sense, if you want to use print or cut or something like that, that that's perfectly fine. All right, so drawing an unknown number from um, uh, minus 10 to 30, and then we want to check if this number is with, within or between zero and 10 inclusively. Um, so I'm just saying if unknown is larger than or equal to 0 and unknown is smaller than or equal to 10. So this is just to have you guys practice with the um, kind of logical boolean operators, right? So the logical and or the logical or. Um, and then I cut again, so I say the unknown value is unknown and then put a new line and otherwise I do a stop error. Um, money, yeah. At least people still remember that there is the mood box. So let me change mine as well. Um, eh, this is just interesting. All right, so um, unknown number. Check if it's between 0 and 10. If not, throw a stop error. And of course, like for stop errors, I use the paste function because I want people to know what is the, um, what is the error, right? So um, to know what is the error, um, we have to give the user the, the number back, right? Because otherwise, how would he know what goes wrong? So let's quickly do this in R. And so I got a number which was 15.08 something, and that's not in range. And of course, we can run it a couple of times. And hey, of course, we can see that when the number is between 0 and 10, um, it is in the right um, order. All right. so. The next question is to use the for loop to sum up the numbers 1 to 1000. Um, so we had a very similar assignment during, or we had a very similar example in the lecture, um, but just to be sure that like people choose names for their variables kind of in a logical way, um, because question 2a and question 2b looks very much similar, um, I decided to store the first sum into for sum. And this for question to be, I actually chose the answer to be while sum. Of course, you can choose any variable name what you want. Um, but eh, what we do is, is we first assign zero to the thing which will hold our answer. And then we go and have the for loop going through um, x. So a new variable called x being one to a thousand. And then of course we do for sum is for sum plus x. And so we just add up x to what we already had. And of course, we have to remember that we store it here. And here you can see where I kind of do my difference between the arrow and the is, um, because I generally tend to use the arrow when I'm defining a new variable. And I tend to use the is when I'm assigning to a variable that is already there. And that is not something that is, that is written or that people do. But for me, I think it's more clear. So when I'm defining a new variable which hasn't existed before, um, I assign or I kind of create it using the arrow key. And when I assign to a variable that I kind of expect there to be already loaded in R somewhere, I use the is. Um, so for me, that's just a physical representation saying that, oh, I'm defining a new variable. And I don't always do it right here. I unknown because unknown already exists, but here I'm kind of overriding the value in, in a way that I'm destroying the initial value. So, but it, generally I use the arrows and the isses for this. All right, so that's the for sum to A. Um, we can run it. Um, the answer should be 500, 500. Um, so let's just go to R and show you guys that that is really the answer. 
So, um, yeah, so it will just add up. And of course, if we wanted to know how this number grows, um, we could do something like, okay, so we want to check it in the middle. Um, then we could say like cut, um, and we could say so far, and then we could say um, comma for some comma slash new line, right? And now this will print to the screen a thousand times, um, but then you can see how the number grows and that might be interesting. And so you, you see that the number kind of just adds up. Um, and so every time um, it, it will just update the number. All right, and of course we're not done, but that's just because R takes a little bit of time. All right, then the while sum. And I think that the while sum is one of the harder ones. So if at the end of the whole lecture series, you're able to write something like this, then I would be very, very happy. Because if you're able to use a while loop and implement the while loop like, like this, um, then that's pretty advanced already. Like that's kind of the goal that I have for the, uh, for, for the lecture that people can do a while sum. Um, I give it as an example or as an assignment in lecture number two. Um, but for me, if like I know that people won't directly understand for loops and while loops. So it, it, it takes a while to kind of get familiar with these concepts. So since the while doesn't allow us to define a variable like the for does, like if you say for x in something, then this defines a new variable x. Um, but here I have to define my own x. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do. So I'm going to define my own x and I'm going to put the number one in there. Then I'm going to define the variable which holds the total, calling it while sum. And initially I put a zero in there. And then I say while the x is smaller than or equal to a thousand, what do I have to do? So I yeah, open up the curly brackets to kind of create a block. And then the first thing that I want to do is add x to the while sum, storing it back in the while sum. So this is what we exactly the same as what we did with the for sum. But now we have to remember that we have to add or increase x by one. If we don't do this, it will just continuously loop and loop and loop because x will never be larger than a thousand. Um, but of course, when we increase x by one, then at a certain point, it will be larger than a thousand. Um, so let's just run this and then we can see that it gives the same answer. So it also should go 500, 500. So that's, um, that's the way that we do it. If anyone has a question, just stop me and um, ask. That's, uh, that's what we're here for. All right, so the next one, question number three was a little bit more difficult. And that is because it is an if statement inside of a for loop. So the way that I would write something like this, and let me pull up the assignments um, just so that I can read the assignment and then do it for you guys live. So it's our course assignments two. All right, so number three says, create a for loop that does the following a hundred times. So when I read something like this, um, then the first thing that I would do is say, okay, so I need something that does something a hundred times. So I'm going to just define four X in one to a hundred, and then I'm gonna just put it like this, right? And that's the first step. Okay, so then I've, I've done the for loop that does something a hundred times. Okay, so the first step is generate a random number between zero and a hundred and store it in a variable. All right, so um, I know how to do this. So it's run if one, zero, 100, right? And the first thing that I'm going to do is check if this does what I want, because hey, of course, the next part of the question is use an if statement to check if the variable is lower, higher, or equal to 42. Um, so I'm just going to just run this in R, right? So that you can see that it draws a single random number between zero and a hundred. Um, and the thing is, is that when I do this, I see that it always draws something behind the comma. So of course I can never compare this to be exactly 42. So at this point I have to kind of realize that this will never be 42. Hey, I can just do this millions and millions and millions of times, but it will never be exactly 42. Right here we get close to 42, but still you have the stuff behind the comma. So at this point you should realize that, oh no, if I want to have a number which is exactly identical to 42, then I have to round down the number, right? Because I need to compare the number to 42. 
So that is what I do, and then I say, okay, so I, I know that this will um, um, that this will generate a random number, but it will have stuff behind the comma. So I'm going to use the round function, and I'm going to round it down, no digits behind the comma. And I think you can also write digits is zero, just to make it a little bit clear, so that we get rid of the stuff which is behind the whole number. Because we do want to compare the number, and we want to get 42, because 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? So. Um, when we do this, um, of course I want to store it in something, let's call this my var. Um, so now I know that when I draw a number, this number will be a whole number, and I can compare this. Alright, so the next is, using an if statement, check if the variable is lower, higher, or equal to 42. Um, and then use the cut function to print one of these three statements. Replace x by the random number generated, and make sure you add a new line to the statement. Right, so that, that's how I answered it here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is ask if the number that I drew is lower than 42. If it is, I'm going to print the number is lower than 42. Else if the number is exactly 42, then I'm going to print 42 is the answer to life, the universe and everything. And else because I don't need to do an else if statement here because I know that when the number is not smaller, and it is not equal to 42, then it has to be larger than 42. So there's no reason here to have an additional statement saying my var uh, larger than 42, because we already know this, right? If, 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 if it's not smaller, and if it's not equal, then it has to be larger, that there's no other possibility for numbers. I use sample instead of run if, and it's a round number. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's, that's a very good very good way of doing it as well. So sample is indeed, sample is generally used if you want to um, mix up a matrix, right? So if you have a matrix and you want to shuffle the rows or the columns, um, then you use the sample function saying from one to the number of columns, draw the number of columns. And then you can use the replace is true or the replace is false to not allow for drawing duplicate numbers. Um, but yeah, you can, you can use the sample function as well. Um, I thought the answer was 420. No, the answer is not 420. The answer is never 420. Even though 420 was last week, it's not the answer. All right, let's let's just run it in R, right, and and see if we get a, a get a nice uh, if we get 42 because that's the uh, that's the goal. So, all right, so let's run it and. And we were pretty unlucky. So in all the draws that we did, we didn't draw 42. So let's just try it again. And here we have it. So here it says 42, the answer to life and everything. All right, so I hope everyone was able to do this one because this one is kind of, and it combines these two concepts. It combines the concept of looping, so doing something an X number of times, combined with the concept of checking if a number is something or something else, right? So, and there's really nothing more in data analysis, right? It, normally you would go through your matrix, through each row of the matrix, and then you would say, well, if the weight of the animal is larger than a certain number, then include it in the experiment, um, otherwise exclude it. I took some time for exercise three, but it was good feel. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that I love about programming, the Erfolgserlebnis, right? The, the, the feeling that you get when you when you work on it for like 45 minutes and you're like, why doesn't it work? And at a certain point you're thinking like, yeah, that, and that's the thing that, that like, that's the thing that I love about programming is, is coding and then in the end getting it to work. Um, and it can be the best feeling in the world. And the thing is, is that you generally can't really share it with anyone. Um, I, I recently spent almost like two days to just make a, triangle on screen and then I got it working I was so happy because it was like almost a thousand lines of code and then like if I would run to my dad and say dad I made a triangle on screen he's like okay and nice but the your folks is it's something that you can enjoy um, and that that's one of the nice things about being a programmer all right, so question number four, uh, use a while or a for loop and the cut function to print out a triangle of hashtags having 12 lines um, 
I, yeah, you cheered for my trying. I'm not saying that no one will understand you. It's just that you have to select your partner in such a way that they also get excited about programming. And you cheered, but if I would have called my dad, he would be like, meh. Like, he, he, he would probably be happy that I'm happy, but he wouldn't really understand the investment. <laughs> All right, so question number four. Use a for loop or a while loop and the cut function to print out a triangle of hashtags. Having 12 lines, each line should have one more hashtag than the previous line. And then there's a spelling error. And then I show you one of these uh, or a part of the triangle. Um, so let's, I can show you my answer. And there have been a lot of interesting answers um, during the past five years that I've been giving the course, I've seen like 20 different answers, I think. And all of them are fine, right? In the end, if you, um, I totally overthought exercise four. Yeah, that's what most people do. Um, so this is kind of the first answer that people come up with. So, or no, generally this would be the first one. Um, all right, so General Gulak, um, let me just, um, get your answer out of Twitch. Um, I think I can just copy paste from here and just put it in here. All right, so let's see. All right, so the first thing that I don't like about the code here, right, is that if you write a for statement, you should use the brackets, right? The, the, the curly brackets are there for a reason. They are there for a reason to make clear to people <laughs> that, that you're starting a something which is inside of the for statement. Right, so if anything, even if you want to keep it on one line, I would always put the, the curly brackets there because the curly brackets just say it goes from here to there. So it's not just something that the computer understands, it also makes it easier for anyone reading your code. Um, all right, so what happens here? So you are doing a cut, which is okay. So let's remove the cut because that's what we will all do. So just make sure that we don't do that. All right, so you paste string replace this thing 12 minus i string. I, I, I'm going to throw it in R and see what it does. I'm, I'm very curious. I, this, is, this is a new answer, so that's always good. All right, let's go to R, throw it in, see what it does. Wow, now that's a good triangle. That's a much better triangle than mine. Um, there are spaces between the hashtags though. I, th I think I made an explicit remark about it that there shouldn't be any spaces between the hashtag. But this looks really, really fun. Like this is a good triangle. <laughs> I have a similar answer for this. So why did everyone look up the string wrap function? That's interesting. That's interesting. Like, is, is there like uh, an, an answer like this somewhere on Stack Overflow where they say you should use string wrap? That's an interesting one. All right, let's put this one in as well. Um, so, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. And this is very similar to mine, right? So my, my original answer, um, which, oh, not this one. Uh, let me show you Notepad++. Um, so my original answer that I came up with was this one. This is just because I wanted people to understand that you can use a double for loop and that a for loop can actually be in bounds that you want. So the, the f initial answer that I came up with was saying, well, I want to do something 12 times, so I'm just going to type 4x in 1 to 12. So what am I going to do? Well, I, I'm going to draw hashtags, right? And the hashtags, I need to have as many hashtags as the line that I'm on. So I'm saying 4y in 1 to x. And so the first time that it goes here, x is 1. So it, it cuts a single hashtag. The second time that it comes in here, then it draws two hashtags. And then, of course, the new line, right, should be outside of the, of the second for loop, right? So you have a for loop, which does some printing and then prints and enter and it just cuts these things of course you can do it a lot lot smaller and this is very similar to the string wrap function of course is that 4x in 1 to 12 cut and then repeat the hashtag x number of times um, paste them together I don't know why there's a slash b in here why the hell did I put a slash b in here let me let me see what that does the slash b Hmm. Interesting. So it doesn't even uh, 
remove the alright so the thing would be something like this might be that the answers were a little bit older um, all right so there was a similar feed in stack overflow about a similar question but they try to build a router ah okay so a diamond shape all right for number in 1 to 12 hashtag is hashtag hashtag is replicate n is number hashtag all right let me let me see if I can get that one for you Jan Hage so this one okay so I think the thing is that twitch throws it all on one line right so you don't really have any code layout so I'm just gonna lay out it as I want and then you're going to print it collapse is nothing that's a good one all right so now everyone's sharing their answers I like this one as well and this one I like a lot because it's very explicit right so you, you define something called hashtag and then you have hashtags which is the the repeat or the replicate um, and I would just say in this case you probably just want to use the rep function um, with n hashtag and then um, number I like the rep function a lot repeat this thing this many times of course the replicate function works as well and then you print pasting them together so this is perfectly fine this will draw a nice uh, nice nice triangle as well all right so Alexander came up with a different answer so let's put that one in there as well all right so y is empty for x in something y paste y oh that's a good one that's a good one I like this one Alexander I like it a lot and you know why I like it a lot because it reuses um, one of the answers that we already had right it looks very similar to the for sum where you add stuff to the sum um, and it's it's very similar to that right so I hope everyone can understand what happens here but he just builds up this this string called y and then every time he just adds a hashtag to it that's a good answer I like it like this is the way that a mathematician would think right there's this joke about a mathematician that that like um, hey you have a physicist and a mathematician in a room and they want to boil a pot with water um, and the first time that they get in the room there's a pot with water and there's an open fire there's a there's an empty there's an empty uh, kettle and there's a, a, a water faucet and there's a fire and so the first time the mathematician and the, the physicist go in and well they take the water they fill the kettle and then they put it on on the on the on on the fire and it boils then this the second time that they come in they come into the room and the kettle is already full so the first thing that the mathematician does is just throw out all of the water from the kettle and then refills it with water and then the physicist asks why do you do that well because I want to go back to the original question because I already solved that one so why think again why not just reuse what I already had first time reading through question four I thought it's a fangfrage because of the hashtag ah because of it being comments yeah that might no it's not I, I, I generally don't try to trick people with with, with like trick questions so interesting all right but I, I hope that everyone sees that there's many many different ways of solving a question like this um, and of course they're all fine in the end when you get a nice uh, router or you get a nice triangle head then that's the head, but the idea is is that you just try and solve it for yourself um, but yeah I like Alexander's I like yours a lot I like yours a lot like it's thinking like a mathematician and going back to a question that you have already answered and then using kind of the structure of that answer to answer the next one interesting all right so question number five escaping so this is just to teach you guys that some things need to be escaped so um, of course uh, there was a sentence I say escaping stuff is great but slash slash uh, but uh, backslash and forward slash might be a nuisance and then we want to have a new line um, and then you are correct but I think that the top and the, the backspace character uh, create more problems than the basic thing so the the, the question was a little bit strange um, because uh, there was a smart quote in there so smart co quotes are something that Microsoft Word does and 
also PowerPoint and these kinds of things. So the smart quotes are the quotes that you put around like a, a statement, right? Um, but in programming, you only have like these real double air quotes. I can zoom in a little bit to show you why the smart quote is different, right? So you can see that the smart quote here is slightly different than this one. It's a little bit less and it and it and it's slanted. And that's just because in typing text, you use smart quotes and Microsoft Word tries to be smart and change quotes by smart quotes. Um, and every time that I make slides for programming in R, it's a it's really annoying because every time that I type like the, the double air quote, um, PowerPoint thinks that I'm starting a real quote from some famous guy and just changes it by a smart quote. And of course, smart quotes are just characters, but they're not the real quote characters. So they, they, they are in the same character set, but they're slightly different. Um, so hey, of course here, um, just escape the, the characters that need to escape. Um, so the, the real double quote needs to be escaped. Um, the tab character or the, the slash character itself needs to be escaped. And of course here you need to escape it as well. Otherwise it will do a tab and a backslash. Um, but of course the smart quote in the end, it doesn't need escaping because it's a different character than the other quote. So just that you're aware that, that some letters and numbers, although they look very similar, um, they are different. The double quote thing cost me at least 15 minutes today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it will bite you in the ass um, because if people do stuff in Microsoft Excel, uh, Microsoft Excel also likes using smart quotes. And then you're hitting yourself over the head because you, you took your data from Excel and saved it to a Word document. And then you're trying to load it in into R and for some reason R just completely messes up the smart quotes. Um, and in this case, it's not too bad. Um, 15 minutes wasted on a single character. That's the essence of programming. I agree, I agree, I agree. That, that's just the way it is. Like It's like working in a lab, right? You have to be very secure. So if you want to, see something funny, then there's an uh, esoteric language. So there's a programming language, which is called Whitespace. Um, and the whole programming language consists of different Whitespace characters. So you have a space, of course, you have a tab character, but then you have like the space character in um, Farsi, and then you have the space character in like Chinese, and these are all different characters. And the computer can read that. So hey, just Google um, on or, or go to Google and Google white space programming language. Um, and then of course, in the end, hey, the whole script is or it looks empty, but you can program more or less anything that you want in it. it you just have to use the right white space characters. Um, of course, this is a complete waste of time, um, but someone figured out or that it was a fun thing to do and have a programming language which only centers around white spaces. All right, then question number six. Um, we spent some time on this um, during the lecture on uh, Tuesday. Um, so if you want to know what you should see here, um, then look at the um, Moodle and, and check out the last part. I think it's the last part of the lecture. Um, I'm just going to run it for you guys and then see what I observe. Um, so I think the question was relatively clear on, on, on what to do. All right, so we set our C to one. We draw a random number between, uh, fi uh, between zero and 10. So we draw 15 random numbers, we round them down and then we'd say random one, right? So it draws the numbers three, four, six, nine and so forth. Then we set our C to one. Now we first draw a normally distributed number and then we do the same call again as that we did before. What do we see now is that if you look at random one, it starts with three, four, six, nine. If you look at random two, it starts with six, nine. So you see that the whole, this part here is the first part here. So by drawing a single random number, not from the norm or from the uniform distribution, but from the normal distribution before we lost two of our numbers in, in the random one draw. So the thing is, is that in many programming languages, every random number function has its own random number generator. But in R, this is not the case. 
R has a single random number generator. And a single random number generator um, will, will feed all of the random number functions. So if I do a uniform number random, so run if, then this will take away from the R uniform. And the R uniform will take away from the run if function. And the R Poisson does the same thing. So they all draw from a single source of randomness. And by drawing a single number here, right, using the R norm function, the R norm function takes away kind of two numbers from the run if function that we do after. And other programming languages don't do this. So I put this in for people that come from like a Java background because they are always stunned that when they reset their seed, doing the same thing is different from doing it the first time. And that is just because they do another function call in the middle. And that just confuses the hell out of them. Um, and of course, if you have no other language experience, then this is just the way that it is, that there's a single source of randomness and drawing a random number using R norm takes away some of the randomness then drawing a random number using the uniform distribution takes away some of it. Um, but other languages do not function that way. So if I think about uh, the D programming language or Java or C sharp, um, they do it in a different way. So there, the R norm function has its own random number generator. The R, uh, the run if function also has its own random number generator. So they don't influence each other. But in R, they don't, and you have to be aware of that, um, especially when you start doing things like multi-core programming. But of course, that's far, far away. Um, it's only lecture three, but. That's the thing that I wanted you to see, that, that there's a shift. And so the first two numbers are used to generate this number, and then all of the other numbers shift. And we talked about it also on the, uh, on the Tuesday seminar, or the Tuesday thing. All right, and that was it. Because, oh, no, we have functions still. Uh, oh yeah, so question number seven. Uh, create a function that returns the result of a coin flip. All right, so first little function. Um, so I called it flip coin. It's a function. It does not take any parameters. And then um, I define a block. So the first thing that I'm going to do is generate a random number, a uniform random number, because coin flips are generally like equal, right? There's an equal chance of putting heads, uh, putting tails. Um, and then um, I draw the random number and then I say when the random number is lower than 0 0.5 I say heads if it's larger than 0 0.5 I say tails and I return this number so the function ends here so as soon as you call return the function stops and it returns the thing which is inside to the user of course the number we could be very very lucky and the number could be exactly 0 0.5 and then I return it's on its side because of course, like I want to, the coin to be eek or to be fair, right? So I want to say heads half of the time, tail more or less half of the time. But the problem is, is that 0 0.5 is also could also be drawn. The chances of it are very very small because it generally draws like five or six digits behind the comma. Um, but there is a chance that you will draw exactly 0 0.5. So in this case, I say that the coin is on its side. Um, so let's just run it and flip the coin a couple of times and see what it comes up with. So let me switch you guys to the R window. All right, so let's flip the coin. And hey, first time I did tails, then I did heads, and then I did tails. So I, I hope everyone was able to do the function um, and hey, because functions. You could also do something like this, where you limit it to either 0 or 1. Yeah, yeah, if you would round it down. But also rounding down has an issue, because rounding down is also not entirely fair, because 0 0.5 exactly gets rounded up. So your function, Salina, has a slightly higher bias towards um, the um, tail side. All right, could someone block the ship Mustang guy. I can actually just do that. Um, uh, where is my moderator tools? Um, no, I want this guy to be reported and um, ah, that's too much work. 
could my moderator just step in? All right, good. Thanks, moderator. Um, yeah, so, but hey, of course, you have to remember that if you draw a random number between 0 and 1, then there's no fair way um, to really um, be equal. So even if you would do something like this, um, let me show you guys the uh, answer. So just that it's not just in chat, but that it's also on the uh, on the screen. All right, so we do a function, then we do if, and then we do else. So again, like I like the curly brackets. So if you use an if statement, always put curly brackets around it. Um, that just makes it so much easier for the reader to read. Um, and then we do tails and we do like this. Yeah, so here the, the this works perfectly fine, just as well as mine. The only thing is, is that here um, the round function will take 0 0.5 exactly and round it up. So it, it has a slight bias to call tails because we're comparing if it's zero. So had the zero will be slightly less conven or slightly less occurring. And of course we can only see this when we draw this uh, coin toss function like a couple of billion times. So if we would run this and do it a couple of billion times and then look at the graph for heads and tails, and then you will see that if you would do this a billion times, then tails would come up slightly, slightly more often than the other one. You can use sample. Sample is probably the best way to sample between uh, one and two. And then if it's one, um, you could also use sample and directly sample heads and tails. Um, yeah, because you can do something like this, like sample, um, where do I want to sample from? Well, I have something called heads, I have something called tails, um, and then sample 10,000 times, and then I say replace equals true, because I, I want to do it, and, and so something like this um, should work as well, and it should sample. And this is the most honest way, because now the, there's no chance of having one of the two being um, being overrepresented. Um, so if we would store this or uh, in something called R and we do a histogram of R, um, then oh, we can do a histogram. Uh, we can. Why can't we do a histogram? Let's just do an S factor on it. Should be no, no. It's not a histogram. What I want is a bar plot. Nope. Um, what I want is a... How's a plot like that called? Uh, I don't care. So do a bar plot and do it as numeric. And then just do a histogram of those. Right, so now we can see that the, they are more or less exactly identical to each other. Um, but if we would use one of these functions with which rounds the number, um, then of course there would be a slight bias towards one of the two. Uh, all right. All right. So next function. I think this one is really nice. So the next function, question six, was just make the make your triangle thing into a triangle function with a parameter called size to make it as big as possible. Um, so I just took my wrap answer, which collapses the thing, um, and then of course you can just use uh, make a triangle as big as you want. Um, of course, it will start looping at a certain point in R, um, but that's okay. So maybe we can do a triangle 25 um, and then it's a little bit bigger. I'm interested in the router thing because that will look very, very funny when you start off from the middle. So, that. All right, question 7a. Why is this numbered so weird? Okay, so then we have question 9, which is the last question. So create a function that calculates the factorial of a given number. Um, the function signature should looks like, look like this. Here, x is the function parameter that represents the hold or the uh, input value from the user. All right, so um, the last one. So question number 9, actually. It used to be 7a, but now it's 9. So then this is question number 8. So let me update that for you guys. So this is my factorial. It takes x. And again, I do the same thing. But now had the f here is my um, sum kind of thing. But since I'm starting to multiply stuff, I cannot put f to 0. 
because if I would put it to zero then of course I would multiply with zero and then it would always be zero so I have to put f to one uh, because the fact that it's a multiplication and multiplication hey, if you multiply a number with zero it's always zero um, and this is different from summing a number to zero right five plus zero is still five but five times zero is zero so hey, if we calculate the factorial um, then we have to start with f being one um, and then we go just through the number so we say for i so i is the the variable that is generated internally in one to x what do i want to do well i want to take the number f and then multiply the i with the f that i already had and then in the end i want to return f um, so let's just run it um, and then the one of the additional assignments um, normally I don't do them but I think that this one is quite funny um, because the plus function we already saw right so we already saw that when we do the plus function um, then if you want to apply the plus function you have to do double quotes but you can also define your own um, operators so you can define your own kind of special function and give it a name like exclamation mark and that's what we're doing here so we're just defining a new function with the name exclamation mark but we we can't do it like this because if we do it like this then now r will not recognize that i'm i'm trying to assign a function it will now say well the exclamation mark is something that i already have defined but we can override these things by doing something like this where we say well make a function call the function exclamation mark um, and then just call the my factorial function and then of course we can use factorial 5 or 5 factorial like this um, to kind of run that all right so let's go to r and let's run the factorial function as well so and of course head this will work um, perfectly fine as well so now we can define our own things and of course we can define a lot um, so you can also use like the skull and bones um, if you wanted to um, because you can just use Unicode characters as well um, so you can make or you can make as funny as function names as you want um, and so in theory you could use also the and so everything that shows up in the mood box is also in R a valid identifier so you could also take like uh, the, the little money face um, and then copy paste it into R and then assign it as a function so you, you can do that so that's allowed all right, so that's that's it for the assignments for today. Um, so let's go to the PowerPoint. All righty then. So the, let's take a look at my answer from lecture two. So we did that. Are there any questions about the assignments? Um, were they hard? Were they too hard? Did you guys enjoy something that you had to kind of think about a little bit? Because that's always what what is difficult for me right like I make the assignments but I have like years and years of programming experience so it might be that in my mind they are really really easy and for you it's like no I spent like half of my weekend on it <laughs> so if you if you think that they are too hard then definitely let me know um, but be aware that some of the assignments are hard not to kind of have you guys work on it for three hours but to also have you guys realize that I'm working on this question now for three hours and I can't figure it out perhaps I should ask someone to to help right because it's programming is something that you only it took a lot of time but I'm fine with it okay Skurita just says crying face which is but then in the end like programming is something that you two hours and got to number five well oh, that's good that's good so that's fine right I don't expect you to do all of them um, hey I expect you to kind of try it do it yourself and if you get stuck right on an assignment and you don't know what to do ask for help because asking for help is nothing which is bad it takes me forever all the time so yeah no but then like be be aware that there's nothing wrong with asking for help like there's there's stack overflow right which is a whole platform which makes their money by helping or connecting people that have questions about programming with other people who ran into the same questions um, or 
had to to help each other yeah, because programming is something that like it works to collaborate and normally when we do would do the assignments we would do the assignments directly after the lecture we would do it in person and then i i always say it's perfectly fine if you want to sit in groups of two or in groups of three um, i also took some hours but after it i understood the functions and loops and that's the thing because at a certain point i think it was difficult maybe i it could help to get answers earlier no I'm not going to put the answers earlier. So in that sense, if you get stuck, just send me an email, ask for help, um, because that's the thing that you should learn as well. You should learn that at a certain point, um, there are things that you don't know, which other people might know. Um, and I don't like people just looking at the answers and then thinking like, yeah, oh, no, so that's how it should be done. Um, I'd rather have people mail me, I give you a hint, if you still can't solve it, then I can show you how it's done. Yeah, because in the end, like only by getting stuck and getting frustrated, um, do you learn in a way. Because without like getting stuck or hitting a wall, um, it's it's really hard to learn new things and to to kind of um, and it takes away from the erfolgserlebnis as well, right? If you just see the answer and think, yeah, that's the way that it should have been done. It, then you don't have this like really nice feeling when you spend like two hours on something and finally you fix it and finally you get it to work and then you're like yeah see I can do it as well um, so that that's the thing that I uh, that I that I, I, I'm, I'm against putting out answers early um, and of course you're more than welcome to join the Tuesday eh? and send me an email because there's it, like there's a lot of help out there um, I'd rather not people spam stack overflow with questions about the R course um, so just uh, yes please same for the examination <laughs> yeah that would be fun right <laughs> yeah uh, then you have to just ask people who did the examination last year because they don't change that much between years so find someone who did the exam last year and just get a copy from them um, Although they're they're different every year, so it's not that you can just remember the answers for the examination and then just go into the examination and pass it. But generally, the examination doesn't have very complex questions on programming. Like you might have to do a little function, um, like a function like the factorial function or um, a little for loop that draw, draws a triangle, um, but I don't expect you guys to be able to do um, something like, um, let me see, are you recording? Yeah, I'm still recording. Um, we should actually take a break soon um, because I've already been recording for almost an hour. So, um. all right. So, but I'm not, I don't want you guys to be able to write like massive amounts of code. I want you guys to understand what you can do with R and how you should do it. Right, like know which functions there are, um, have what kind of parameters these functions have, and then that for me is good enough. Um, have because in the end, you're only going to learn programming by practicing, and in the end, I can't really kind of grade how much you practice because I I, I don't know how much you practice. So that's the thing. Um, all right, so. Um, Let's take a little break. And this is going to be a little bit annoying, so I will stop.